morning, Mrs. Wolfe. Good morning. We shall publish no more new authors. I have to tell you, I've discovered ten errors in the first proof. Lucky to have found them, then. Passchendaele was a charnel house from which no men returned. Do you think it's possible that bad writing actually attracts a higher incidence of error? <laughs> that has got to be just about the only joke in this whole movie. But man, it is a doozy. Welcome to the Cinema Psych Podcast, the podcast where psychology meets film. I am your host, Dr. Alex Swan, and today we are going to delve deep into human drama. Today's film is going to be about the hours. Yeah, 2002 came out. Oh boy, this one was Oscar fodder for sure, but it really does have some wonderful performances by Nicole Kidman, Meryl Streep, and Julianne Moore, including performances by Ed Harris and um, many other fantastic actors, Stephen Delane, all those sorts of people. A wonderful, wonderful movie. And wonderful, wonderful performances. It is a bit on the on the sullen and uh, and very dour side, though. So you know, if that's your kind of movie, then I definitely recommend it. As I said, the movie came out in two thousand two. Nicole Kidman won the Best Actress Oscar in two thousand three for that performance as the real person, Virginia Woolf. The uh, the great writer, the great American author who unfortunately um, died by suicide in 1941 in um, in England. And uh, the beginning of this film, spoiler alert, starts with that moment in history in 1941. Uh, Virginia Woolf drowning herself via the river by their cottage. This is... Uh, This film was directed by uh, Stephen Daldry. This is not a name that I have heard uh, before, but I I mean, it was an interesting vision. And I think he pulled it off with the three disparate in time stories, but also kind of brought the three together because, of course, the plot of this film is that these three women that I told you about, including the real uh, Virginia Woolf, played by Nicole Kidman, that is uh, that is the main plot, is that these these women are uh, interconnected somehow. And, and it's an interesting vision from Stephen Daldry. I'm not sure how much more we'll say about him in this episode, but uh, uh, I just wanted to make sure I got that out in front. Now, before we get into the episode with my guest host, I did want to mention that the podcast is two years old as of this uh, this episode going out uh, first published in the beginning of August, I think somewhere around there. And uh, so, yeah, this is uh, the we have done two full years of this podcast, uh, about 35, 36 episodes, depending on how you count episode zero. Uh, iTunes counts it as, or I should say Apple counts it as episode one, and so does Spotify. So I guess we've done about 36 episodes of this lovely podcast, and and I've got uh, lots of guests lined up still, so we are moving into year number three. So boop, boop, boop. I probably won't be doing another year in review like we did for that first one. It was it was kind of like the first year anniversary. Let's take a look. But I think we have a good vision of going forward. And like I said, lots of fantastic guests coming up and some changing formats a little bit. Uh, I'm going to have uh, a uh, duo come on 
for the first time. So there's going to be two people other than me talking. So there's a lot to come come in this uh in this next year, our third year, running strong, running strong. And I thank you for listening uh, to some of those episodes or maybe all of those episodes in the last two years. So my humblest gratitude to all that listen to this show, whether it's one episode or more. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And while I'm on that train, the other thing that I wanted to mention before we jump into the episode is um, I have a, you know, it's kind of a side venture. I have a a YouTube channel where I have tutorials, so I thought I'd I'd take a moment to plug my own YouTube channel just in case there is not a mixture of uh, audience members uh, in either case. Uh, I recently uh, made YouTube Partner. And uh, that was really cool. It was really uh, a um, milestone for sort of the work that I had been putting in over the last couple of years, wanting to do tutorials and sharing psychology stuff. And, you know, there's a there's like a creative of mixture between the Cinema Psych podcast and my YouTube channel because I also share the podcast episodes as video in case you're unaware that's I'm I'm sort of take the audio visualize it with a little waveform put my picture the guest picture and and um it's a a, a way to it's another way to to listen to the podcast or quote unquote watch it so um my YouTube channel is primarily tutorials for statistics and statistics apps like Jamovi uh, and Jasp. Uh, but I do share some of my other endeavors there. Like I said, the podcast is uploaded there. Uh, my VODs from streaming on Twitch.tv uh, get uploaded there uh, periodically. I sort of edit them, edit them down. But if you're interested in that sort of thing, the way to find me is www.bit.ly so the bit.ly link slash alexander swan that is my name so bit.ly slash alexander swan and you will get directly to my youtube channel all right so with the celebration and the (laughs) self-flagellation what it Sort of was. So I'm going to be into you, you know, please. (laughs) Uh, Without further ado, let's just jump into the episode. My guest host today is Dr. Crystal Steltonpole. Crystal is an assistant professor at the University of Southern Indiana and a community psychologist. This is a new one for the show. Her research focuses on how people interact with and through technology, and that is really awesome. And she is the founder, co-founder, excuse me, of the Online Technologies Lab. Crystal, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Alex. I'm really excited to be here. I am definitely happy to have you on. We've been talking about this for a little while now. Uh, but like I do with all of my guests, before we jump into uh, this episode's film, The Hours, uh, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on film in general and um, using them. Or if you haven't yet, would you use them in uh, in your teaching? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. I. I think when used responsibly, that that film can be used um, as an excellent tool in the classroom because it can help us to understand classroom concepts and we can understand mm-hmm. how society was viewing an issue during a certain time period through decisions that like directors and writers make. Right. Uh, we can critique portrayals of popular scientific knowledge, you know, that, that we only use 10 percent of our brain stuff that pops up sometimes <laughs> in movies. Yeah. Um, and I think it can also help us explore our understanding of ourselves, like what our morals are, what we value and what moves us. And that's what I'm really hoping for with the hours. I've used other films in classes. Um, this will be the first time that I'm using this film in a class uh, this fall. And I'm I'm hoping that it can lead to some um, really good discussions like the one that I hope that we're about to have, um, particularly from a community perspective, when we aren't just looking at the women's the women in this movie um, themselves and their symptoms but also their environments, the people that they talk to, their communities, and where the pain points are in our society and our institutions. That's awesome. And and that is like 100% why I wanted you to have you on the show before the fall started, especially as this this episode goes live, you know, uh, in a few weeks, excuse me. Um, 
So for those of you listening now, it's it's obviously in the past that we've had this conversation, but it's useful for Crystal too because she's about to you know use this uh, film in a class, and I have made similar kinds of decisions. Uh, and wanting to have conversations. And there are a few episodes where that I'm sim- I'm like, I'm going to use this film again. Like a couple of episodes ago, I talked about Unsane and I'm like, yeah, I'm totally going to use Unsane mm-hmm. again. So uh, I hope this is a wonderful, wonderful resource for you moving forward. And, and maybe, <laughs> some, you know, maybe you'll be like, if you're having trouble figuring <laughs> out stuff, there's a podcast you can go look at. <laughs> Fun I know a guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. So let's pivot to the hours because you ended your uh, you ended your uh, point there with uh, the hours. So talk to me more broadly about the hours itself, the film. I mean, not not the unit of measurement of time, but the film and what it means. Why a little bit more you want to use it in this um, community psychology class. Yeah, I I think I should actually start off by saying that when I was an undergrad, I was actually a psychology and an English major. So um, I was really, really drawn to this film for a number of reasons. And I think first, the movie is just fantastic from a storytelling perspective. It's it's a little slow in some spots, but there are these Mm. really beautiful parallels between the three stories that are being told. And as it all really comes together in the third act, I mean, it's it's still really impactful for me. And I've I've seen this movie a billion times, uh, give or take a few times. (laughs) <laughs> um, I think I think it also has a lot to say, you know, intentionally or unintentionally about the, the enduring stigma around depression and other mental health conditions, the expectations put on women in our society and, and our general unease with death and dying and talking mm-hmm. about it. Um, I know that I have a lot of death and dying anxiety myself. Um, so it's kind of funny for me to love this movie so much. I was telling you before we started recording that. I, you know, I used to watch this uh, movie about once a year. Um, mm-hmm, it is yeah. one of my favorite movies. Um, and so it is it is kind of funny for me to love the movie so much. Um, but I think that this particular movie would be an excellent addition to any class that's covering mental health and or societal issues, particularly around gender, sexuality, uh, and institutional or community support. Yeah, those are all great points because there's a lot in this, just like a, a, many of the movies that are on the show and will be on the show in the future. There is not just one uh, aspect of psychology we can talk about because uh, as as uh, has also been mentioned on the show many times, you know, a lot of the way reasons why psychology teachers love to use films in their teaching, as said by many uh, guest hosts, mm-hmm. is that psychology is movies movies is psychology so there's a lot to get from this and as i watched it from for the first time myself uh because i am if you look at my film history and i've been and i've been starting to track this recently if you look at my film history very few are these kind of period dramas Uh, I I do like a specific kind of period drama for specific periods, but for this particular one, like, I I don't think I've ever read anything by Virginia Woolf, Mm -hmm. um, and I I, I don't know if, if the, what was sold through trailers or anything would have appealed to me at any time in my movie watching history. The trailer for this movie, I will say, is awful. (laughs) I saw it, and you're right. <laughs> so, well, there we go. And I was, I suppose in 2002, I wasn't uh, into, as a teenage boy, was not into the uh, slow period drama. Of course, watching it through a psychology lens is 100% why I watch movies now. I, uh, you know, Outside of the shoot 'em up, blow 'em up, or the superhero stuff, because you know that's just made for entertainment. If you find deeper meanings in those movies, please put down the cannabis. Um, so, being able to watch this movie for the first time with that lens has actually been, uh, and and doing so uh, in the previous episode about the Truman Show kind of uh, uh opening reopening some some eyes in my head that's a strange phrase but okay we'll go with that all right since you mentioned crystal a few 
things, I think right off the bat, we should talk about how this film shows a, a significant amount of mental health um, crises across the three women characters, the three main characters, although technically Nicole Kidman is the main character, even though Meryl Streep has more screen time than her. I don't know, but that's how they did it. So we have the main character, Virginia Woolf, and that's probably because she was a real person. And, um, you know, it's her story that sort of thrusts the interweaving plot line through. So, uh, Crystal, what are the mental health aspects of this film that any teacher of psychology could use this film for? Yeah, I think, you know, this is kind of a hard movie to watch in a lot of ways because it does deal with mental health so deeply. Um, and I think the, the very obvious one is, is depression slash bipolar. We're not really entirely sure what Virginia Woolf would have really been diagnosed with if they yeah. had current standards of, you know, DSM. Um, but I think I think the real Virginia Woolf probably did have bipolar disorder um, and that you can kind of see hints of that throughout uh, throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. But all three of the women are dealing with depression in different ways. Um, yeah. So Virginia Woolf um, is the, her time period is set in the, the 1920s um mm -hmm. in england and so um she's been dealing it with it for a long time we get several hints about that and some explicit references to um having attempted suicide twice and then of course we know um from the first like minute of the movie that she does um eventually complete it um mm -hmm. and then we've got um laura who's played by uh julianne moore um, and she is a 1950s housewife that's post-World War II. Um, she's got a child. It's Richard, who we see later as an adult in the, in the film. Um, and uh, she's pregnant, so she's got another child along the way. Um, mm -hmm. she, um, so she's got kind of a, a, um, a more subtle kind of depression. It's, it's hard at times to tell because, um, you know, Dan mentions that she was kind of shy growing up. So it's kind of hard to tell, like, how much of it is her being introverted. And then but we do generally genuinely see she's struggling with some stuff. Yeah, um, I think um, I think Julianne Moore plays the like micro expressions really well for that aspect to get to give you a sense that she, like in this moment, she's really hurting. Yeah, yeah. And she's she's clearly struggling with some other stuff, which I'm sure we'll get to the sexuality part as well. But she yeah. seems to be really struggling with her identity as a mother, her identity as a woman, mm -hmm. um, her identity as, as a wife and whether that's really the life that she wants for herself. Um, and Virginia, where Virginia was actually diagnosed by a doctor, although it's not really clear whether it was hysteria or what it was that she was diagnosed with. Yeah. And questionable has, diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, the real life quote about Virginia, uh, Virginia Woolf is that she was a victim of male uh, medicine. Um, and I think that really applies and is highlighted in the movie. Yeah. Laura is not diagnosed, but we see her, she's probably treating some symptoms of it because her medicine cabinet does have stuff like sleeping pills and stuff like that. So we know that she's sleeping a lot. We know that she's having trouble sleeping. So She's probably self-diagnosing to some bit, or if she's going to a doctor, it's probably not for depression; it's for sleep issues. Um, I also thought when I saw when I saw that note that you had put in there that you know this was hers. I don't know if we see the labels at all. Mm. Yeah, it could be Dan's too. Yeah, so that's my thought because you know he came back. We we know that he come comes back from World War II, and a lot of soldiers. Just like in World War One, where it was named shell shock, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of soldiers were coming back with shell shock, you know, different kind of shell shock, but still post traumatic stress disorder as we know it now. Um, it could, you know, it could be him who uh, struggles, and she just knows that it's there. So I was, I was, uh, I, that thought occurred to me when I saw you write mm -hmm. that because I was like, hmm, we never see the labels. Yeah, it could yeah. absolutely not even be hers um, that she's taking because it does seem like she's hiding a lot of it from Dan. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, we have um, we have Clarissa, who's played by uh, Meryl Streep, uh, one of my personal favorite actresses. Um, mm -hmm. And um, she is uh, it's set in 2001. She's in mm -hmm. New York. Um, Laura's set in uh, Laura's timeline is set in Los Angeles. Um, and Virginia is almost certainly not diagnosed. We don't see any mention of it. She's not taking any medication. Um, or anything like that. The way that she seems to be treating her struggles is by overcommitment, um, yeah. by perfectionism, um, by um, <laughs> just 
almost like forcing herself to be an extrovert, right? Like planning the party. She is yeah. Mrs. Dalloway, um, as as referenced by by Richard later on. Right. And um, and it, there's a clear uh, mention of the character of Mrs. Dalloway. I think it's by Laura telling Kitty uh, about the book, um, saying that she was this um, master uh, a hostess and that she threw mm -hmm. extravagant parties and things like that. And um, Laura was sort of reading the book maybe pining for a life like that I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to read that uh, based on some of the other things that you had mentioned about her that we'll probably get into yeah 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 and i, I think also too it, it's kind of a, it's definitely foreshadowing you know clarissa's struggles but i also think it's a brief reflection on kitty right because she always she says to kitty like you're so good at that meaning making friends yeah. um and and when kitty opens up is after explaining the book um, so she says, That's you know, true. she's, she throws all these parties, but because she does it so well, like people think that she's okay, but she's really not. And then that's when Kitty says, yeah, they found a growth on my uterus and like gonna have to have surgery. Um, she's right. I'm really worried about it. Um, and then that long conversation about child, um, deserving each other and, and, um, after the war and, and all that kind of stuff happens. But, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll come, yeah. we'll circle back to that with, with, um, sexuality, but, um, so Clarissa is, um, is a publisher yeah i think so and uh she is in a relationship with a woman named sally played by anna allison jane janney um and they live in a loft in in new york and um she is a caretaker of richard who uh i believe uh they had a relationship mm -hmm. uh sorry uh, clarissa and um richard had a relationship um and so Richard is uh, un an unfortunate AIDS victim. Um, and up until the spoiler alert end of the movie, uh, what uh, for all intents and purposes seemed like an AIDS survivor, you know, a long, longer term AIDS mm -hmm. survivor um, until he uh, dies by his own throwing himself outside out of a, win a window. Well, sort of like tipping himself off it, I mm -hmm. suppose. Um, so uh, he is a writer, am I not mistaken? Did yeah, he's, I, a, okay. he's a poet, but he had written one, one book, um, a very dense, uh, difficult to understand book. Okay, I think I missed some of that in the repartee between uh, uh, Clarissa and uh, Richard. And I don't know if this is normal. Uh, for however many times this you have shown this movie to a first timer, but it took me to the very end, and I don't know if this was on purpose or not, to recognize that uh, Richie, the little boy in the 1950s, is Richard, played by Ed Harris in 2001. Mm -hmm. Are you supposed to only get that reveal at the end? Yeah, I think um, where I realized it was um, there's when she is i think when she's leaving at one point like richie is like banging on the doors and she you know they just called him richie and then it like faded to richard and i was like mm. wait a minute and there's there's like a picture of a really forlorn looking bride on on his desk and that's when i that's when i ended up putting it together so it's like well into act three where you're like oh shit and then afterwards um after he dies right and then laura comes in and and explains like why she left and and all those things that's when you're like oh okay <laughs> okay all right that, that that's fair now my 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 follow-up question to that is um how does that change the narrative when you watch it again with that knowledge does it change some of the way that ed harris characterizes himself before we get that extended look of the you know the cake baking maybe uh, yeah um you know i don't i don't really know how to feel about that particular turn in the story other than it's a nice storytelling device right sometimes yeah. i'm like it really doesn't affect the reading of it for me at all like I, I don't necessarily particularly care um but i think sometimes when i watch it to me it makes richard's life a little bit sadder even because um you know, Laura mentions after he dies that she's outlived that whole family, right? Yeah. His dad got, died pretty young. Then his sister died, and we're not really sure how she died. The dad died of cancer. 
Um, so he's lost a lot of family, right? And then, um, you know, he, however it happened, he ended up losing Clarissa, um, but she's still, you know, always there. Um, he lost Lewis in a sense. Um, mm-hmm. Lewis left him, um, as he, as he said, that was like one of the best days of his life or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, and then who knows how many friends, you know, how he's lost to, to AIDS and stuff like that. So I, it, to me, sometimes it just kind of compounds a bit of the tragedy and it. Take my hand. Would you be angry? Would I be angry if you didn't show up at the party? Would you be angry if I died? If you died? Who is this party for? What do you mean, who is it for? What are you asking? What are you trying to say? I'm not trying to say anything. Mm -hmm. I'm saying... I think I'm only staying alive to satisfy you. Well, so that is what we do. That is what people do. They stay alive for each other. And the doctors told you, you you don't need to die. They told you that. You can live like this for years. Well, exactly. I don't accept this. I don't accept what you say. Oh, and it's for you to decide, is it? How long have you been doing that? How many years? Coming to the apartment. What about your own life? What about Sally? Just wait till I die. Then you'll have to think of yourself. How are you going to like that? Richard? It would be great if you did come to the party, if you felt well enough to come. Just to let you know, I am making the crab thing. Not that I imagine it makes any difference to you. Of course it makes a difference. I love the crab thing. Clarissa! Yes? I'll be back at 3.30, and I'll help you get dressed. Wonderful. 3.30. Wonderful. alone in an apartment by himself right friends don't come to visit him it, it seems like it's just clarissa um, and like meals on wheels or something yeah yeah and so you know to me it kind of compounds the tragedy and then sometimes i read it and it doesn't or i watch it and it doesn't really affect me at all um gotcha. in terms of the emotional impact i appreciate that that read on it i don't know if i'll find myself watching it again but you know i can I, I don't know the the um having children made the um leaving him at the uh babysitter's house mm-hmm. very anxiety stripping. I was like, oh God, is it hot in here? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not even I'm not even a mother, but I I I told my wife that um you know there's there's the scene and she's like, yeah, I don't think I could have done that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that yep, that's fair. So yep. um before we delve more into those things, I did want to finish up on uh the mental health ac- aspect of the film. So you mentioned that Virginia Woolf um had uh showed some signs of bipolar disorder historically. Um, yeah, in my reading, it it's like you know, most um post-mortem evaluations will say not of actual not of actually her body but of her writings and her um uh sort of uh evaluations her 
her medical records and things seems to suggest what we would now call bipolar disorder. Um, and it sort of feels a little bit like that in the movie. Um, she, uh, at, at, at some, uh, turns just seems completely out of it, um, in a, in a deep depression. And she explains that in probably one of the more stronger monologues in the movie at the train station to her, her husband, um, about the darkness. Um, and then at, at other parts in the movie, she, um, seems sprightly and exuberant um she uh has a an interesting kiss uh on uh of her sister like they like have a passionate kiss uh in one moment so that also looks like mania but to see those two things interconnected in a short what appears to be a short amount of time um don't necessarily know how long it has been um doesn't seem like normal tracking, but of course, you know, the movie's playing a little bit with historical information. Um, what else uh, did you notice about Virginia Woolf? And then uh, if you could uh, explain to the listeners sort of the various time points and mental health treatment. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think across all three of these women, you can tell like just watching them, I think a, 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 a lay person could say, these women are depressed, right? On some level, mm. they they are depressed, even if that depression manifests differently um, in each of them. And I think that they all show some pretty, like if you we opened the DSM and we flipped to the depression page and we mm -hmm. you know did a checklist, I think that um, they they fit a lot of those standard signs. But I think there's also a couple of um, uh, less common um, symptoms. So, for instance, Virginia mentions at certain points that she hears voices. Um, and that is, um, that is a, it, we, we tend to associate that with schizophrenia, um, sure. but other, other diagnoses also have that symptom. And I think, don't quote me exactly on this percentage, but I think it's something like one in seven or one in five or something folks who are diagnosed with like, ma um, major depressive disorder, um, hear voices of some kind. Mm -hmm. But because of the, I think because of the association with disorders like schizophrenia, people are less yeah. likely to disclose that right um yeah. especially to like a doctor or something they're afraid that they're going to get locked up or um, yeah whatever um and then we also see like with carissa then also with laura to a lesser extent this um this over commitment or um in laura's case especially this perfectionism um you know and and this um hesitancy to do tasks that are considered to be um i don't think cake that cake baking is not necessarily a simple task um, you know, yeah, they make not them... particularly um, Ooh, yeah. artistic. The de decorating part, I love the baking part. The decorating part is a nightmare for me. Um, <laughs> so the fact that people are like, "Oh, well, this is so basic. You should be able to do this." I was like, "Well, I think maybe you need to calm down a little bit." But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but so we do see these these different um, additional symptoms um, that are there. Um, that I think could make for an interesting conversation around um, what depression looks like. And even in the DSM, there's several symptoms that are like kind of multi-loaded. It's like an increase or a decrease in appetite. So we see um, uh, Virginia, she doesn't eat very much. Um, right. And so like we, we see these we see these differences. So even though they all have the same disorder, it's it's manifesting um, in, a, in different ways. Although Virginia also, I mean, she probably is bipolar, so that makes her a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but the treatment is interesting, too, because Virginia is the only one that's diagnosed with anything that we're aware of in the movie. Um, mm -hmm. And her treatment is to isolate her and to keep her from being productive. Um, and actually, a bit of a historical note, um, at the time, uh, people looked down on educating women, and they actually often blamed women's mental health issues on being educated. Um, so there were there were oh, some yeah. doctors out there who were saying, you know, Virginia Woolf's the way that she is because she went and got herself educated. Oh, my um, God. So uh, that's I think that's a big thing. And and that I think ties into, you know, we'll we'll get into it in a bit. But like this idea of like patient rights, you know, Virginia has to advocate for herself because it's like she's even having trouble getting through to her husband at times. Um and and this idea of like the doctor coming in as the expert, right? But sometimes the patient knows a little bit more about themselves than the doctor does, um, and what would be good for them. So they they kind of shipped her out um, to I yeah. can't remember which city, 
but it's not really a city. Richmond. It's, it's Richmond. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's isolated. She just has her husband. Her husband sometimes is really tense with her. Um, and she has the the two, um, I guess you'd say servants who who don't necessarily super like her very much. Um, right. So and she sees her sister, and we're not really entirely sure how often that is. So she's got nobody. Um, and that that we know now that 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 tends to make people worse, being isolated and being broken off from your community and not having that sense of belonging that actually tends to make those symptoms worse. Yeah. Uh, I 100% agree with that, that last point for sure. Uh, I did, as you were saying this, I, I did just realize that at similar situation to both Laura and Clarissa, uh, Laura doesn't really have anybody. She has her son and, um, you know, I guess friends about the neighborhood friends of or wives of who are wives of dan's Mm -hmm. friends right and um they have sort of that they don't really have that full full full-on deep friendship uh just sort of acquaintances really so laura's isolated and clarissa um seems isolated too uh very uh i suppose infrequently from my read of it, visiting uh, with Richard. I mean, maybe regularly, but uh, I'm, I guess I shouldn't pair that with infrequently. But it doesn't seem like it's like, oh, like every other day or something like that. It's just uh, seems disjointed. Um, doesn't seem like she sees her daughter all that often. Mm-hmm. Played um, also like surreptitiously by Claire Danes. I was like, "What?" <laughs> uh, didn't was not expecting that. Uh, and then um, seems sort of stuck slash trapped slash bored with her relationship, mm-hmm. which I believe is what ten years old. She said ten. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she, I think, believes herself. Yeah. Uh, so they all seem isolated to me. So that is a, a wonderful point. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting because there are points of support, right? It's not like Virginia doesn't communicate with her partner. It's it's you know Laura and Clarissa don't seem like they really communicate with their partner necessarily, sure. Um, or when they do, there's like breakdowns there. But you know, it seems like um, you know that that the communication is either fraught or tense or awkward or very um, superficial. And Clarissa actually seems and. I mean, I would also be uncomfortable with the conversation that Richard has with her in the apartment in the beginning Um, because he's kind of calling her out. Right. And he's like, eventually I'm going to die and you're going to have to think of yourself. Right. Um, (laughs) I actually got the impression that she sees him a lot um, just from the way that other characters responded. Like, so she was right upset. And then Julia, um, the daughter, comes home and says, you know, like, what's wrong? And then she's like, oh, this is about Richard. So, like, it seems like these conversations uh, okay. happen kind of frequently or at least frequently enough that, like, neither Sally nor um, Julia seem to like Richard very much. And, and that uh, we don't know okay. how long that they've known him um, in terms of or how long he's been diagnosed um, and, and had to deal with the disease and stuff. But it seems like there's kind of a history there of him. Him always being around is is kind of how I ended up reading it, um, but it, we're, it's not necessarily super clear. Um, but but yeah, there's this kind of disconnect where it's like even when you are around people, right? You're not necessarily having that deep communication. Like again, with with Laura's friends, she's only got Kitty coming over because Kitty's husband Ray is friends with her husband Dan. They don't exactly have shared interests. They don't exactly have shared history or experiences right. or anything like that right and honestly um, she came over for one to get something yeah please feed my dog and yeah things, you know and yeah <laughs> so it is it's really isolating and when and you know if especially if you're in a position where you are either hearing literal voices or you have the self-talk of perhaps not feeling um, like you're worthy or perhaps feeling like you're stuck to also not have anyone to confide those feelings in. Because who is Clarissa going to tell that she's feeling stuck? She kind of tries to tell Julia who gets offended. Like, I I can't imagine having that conversation with my partner saying, I feel like we've wasted the last 10 years. Like, I, 
that would be a really hard conversation to have if you yeah. haven't built up that habit of communication. Right. And it will it will probably come crashing down very quickly. I do I do agree with that. Um I think she kind of tries to tell uh Lewis played by mm-hmm. Jeff Daniels a, a little bit as they're talking about Richard because he's uh, one of Richard's exes. Mm-hmm. So she has a breakdown and because she's like trying to get it out and she just can't and it just kind of all floods and he's like, oh, God, what do I, I don't want to do anything. I don't know. Do I do I go? What do I do with this sobbing woman? I don't know how to do. I thought that was some <laughs> random acting choices by the director and Jeff Daniels. Do what? Do you want me to go? <laughs> Strange. She's across the room. Um, do I just leave? <laughs> I don't know how to deal with crying people. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a quick break. And uh, then when we come back, I think we'll jump into some of the uh, uh, more specialized stuff that Clarissa, or Clarissa, <laughs> Meryl Streep, that Crystal <laughs> um, spotted in the film. So stay tuned and stay with us. Hey, listener, thanks for sticking around this episode. I hope you're enjoying it. Anyway, I need your help in growing this podcast's audience. In past episodes, I've asked you to share this podcast with five of your friends. Let's keep doing that. Share this podcast on social media, especially if you really liked an episode. Share that episode. Tell five of your friends or family if they have an interest in film or psychology, or even better, both. Growing the audience is our goal for the second year of programming, and so we need your help to get that done. Other ways to contribute to the podcast include tips to our PayPal, found on our website, becoming a patron at patreon.com slash cinemapsychpod, rocking some sweet merch from our Spreadshirt shop, and or leaving us a rating or review on your favorite podcast service. Now back to the show. And we are back with Dr. Crystal Seltonpole talking about the film The Hours. So we were finishing up our discussion about mental health and I realized during our quick break that we didn't actually sort of danced around a little bit, but we need to get right into the other big mental health theme slash uh, life, I suppose, theme, which is that of suicide, which can accompany depression, as we talked about before in the last segment before the break. Um, But I think that can lead us into uh, the discussion uh, around right to life, right to death, and patient rights that are sort of depicted throughout the movie. So, Crystal, what were your thoughts about the suicide, sort of uh, s- the somberest of dourest of topics in the movie? Yeah, I mean, I think the movie um, does an interesting thing where it starts off with one. Um, oh, yeah, I was so, totally surprised. So you're like, oh, this is going to be that kind of movie, um, which is part of why the trailer is so funny, really, because it, it just does not have the same feel vibe as as the actual movie ends up having. But they start with that. And I think it's kind of I don't want to say the less shocking of the suicides that are portrayed. And then um, and, and to be clear, that's Virginia Woolf's real yes. life suicide. Yeah. The the where she walks into the river and kind of just floats away. Mm-hmm. Um, it's less. I don't want to say graphic because I don't want to say that Richard's suicide is necessarily graphic, but there is this kind of visceral feeling that you have when it happens. It oh, is more, oh, yeah. it's more sudden. You kind of gasp along with uh, Clarissa, you know, and, and you, you feel that, that kind of sinking dread. Um, whereas I feel like Virginia's doesn't evoke that. I mean, it's still like, you're still like, holy crap, this is happening, but it's, it's not this, I don't know. It's, it's a different vibe. So I think it's interesting it's that they start with that almost to, to, kind of get you prepared um, kind of for the end and for the themes that throughout, because it's not like it's um, it's not like that's the only two times that that is discussed or that it, that it happens because right. we also see Laura contemplates it actually makes a plan for it shows up and then second guesses herself and 
um, just kind of has a, a real good cry, a breakdown um, in in the hotel. And then um, as she dis- discloses later on, um, that's when she makes her other plan, which was which was to leave and to move to Canada. Right. Um, so, you know, it is it is um, it is interesting to see these these different people and and to think about, like, the reasons why they would end their lives the way that they were feeling um, and also the effect on the people uh, the people around them um, and the circumstances under which. Um, one of the things that's echoed between Virginia and at Richard's deaths, um, Virginia writes a note, which is fairly uncommon as I understand it, um, in suicides. And she writes this this le- fairly lengthy letter um, to her husband, Leonard. And um, at one point she says, I don't think two people could have been happier than we've been. Dearest. I feel certain that I'm going mad again. I feel we can't go through another of these terrible times and I shan't recover this time. I begin to hear voices and can't concentrate. So I am doing what seems to be the best thing to do. You have given me the greatest possible happiness. You have been, in every way, all that anyone could be. I know that I am spoiling your life. And without me, you could work. And you will. I know. You see, I can't even write this properly. What I want to say is that I owe all the happiness of my life to you. You have been entirely patient with me. And incredibly good. Everything has gone from me but the certainty of your goodness. I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been, Virginia. And then Richard, when he's talking to Clarissa right before he rolls out of the window, um, he says the same line. Um, so it's kind of wrapping up that that um, those mirror, uh, the foil there, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, but we can see, um, you know, with Virginia and also with Richard, um, who I think are kind of, in a way, the, maybe the main foils of this movie, um, we do see that everyone else, or I don't want to say everyone else, their partners, I, I feel weird calling Clarissa Richards partner, but the caregiver, um, they live with that anxiety of something bad happening. Um, they live with that frustration of not knowing how to help. Um, and they know that that threat is there. Um, I don't know what you thought about when you were, when you were watching. Uh, about Richard? About about any of it, I yeah, yeah. I, I always have a lot of different thoughts. I had somebody when I was um, when I was in high school, my cousin had uh, completed suicide, so I always have those. You know, I I have that personal connection to those. Mm-hmm. I have that personal reaction to that. Sure, um, but it, it's kind of hard sometimes to take um, take that step back and look at it more academically. Sure, yeah, um, I I do not have that particular kind of. Well, I I take that back. Uh, one of my uh, cousins. Um, died by suicide coming up coming up very soon on 10 years so um i didn't know him very well he was one of the older cousins of my gigantic family i didn't know him very well but yeah i i suppose i have a similar take to it um obviously not a great subject to talk about but one that we should um Regarding the two completed suicides in the movie, uh, historically, Virginia Woolf's and I went and I looked that up afterward after she did it. And I was like, oh, OK, that's why they started the movie with this one, because, you know, people who know about Virginia Woolf probably know that this is the thing. And I figured what she figured out what she was doing. And you're right. It's a little bit slower. So it's less visceral um, because I figured out what she was doing when she put the rock in her coat mm-hmm. pocket. I'm like, okay, yeah, all right. You can take the coat off, but okay. 
uh, that's is, is exactly where my mind went. It's mm-hmm. like, is it really going to be a wait? Because if you really did want to survive, you could just peel the coat off. But it's fine. Um, that's me interjecting humor yeah, yeah. into a um, very weighty subject. Uh, but I had no clue that that's what I'm I was, actually. I, I take it back. I'm like, OK, yep, he's going to do something. I didn't realize he was going to um, fall out of the window on purpose. But to do it in front of Clarissa, I think, is another level. It's very shocking because, like, as you said, we are Clarissa gasping at the same time. But just as a as a means in real life to do it in front of somebody is is another level of visceral. Um, it is intentional. It is an act for sure. Um, Although I, I will note that he was not planning on her being there. Right. She was early. And so he that's was true. Like, she was early. She was early and he was kind of upset about that, but he had taken a lot of medication. So, OK, that's a fair read. Like we can jump into the the right to life, right to death discussion as well here in an earlier conversation, uh, which is a very morbid conversation, but a, an important one to have with a long term partner is like, what what are your wishes? What right, do you, what do right. you want to do? Yeah. And both my wife and I have stated that we would like a DNR. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those who are not familiar with that acronym um, is the do not resuscitate order. So. Essentially, we would we sign off on no life saving measures. Right. Which is a tough conversation to have with somebody, but it is a required conversation. Um, You don't have a lot of say in how you go sometimes. Right. (laughs) I will say a lot of times. Probably most times. Yeah. Ninety nine point nine percent of times. Um. But at least that gives you some control. Uh, You can't be mad about it afterward, which is also, I guess, part of it. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, At least you would hope that people who love you would respect your wishes, you know, and don't bury you when you said when you said, damn it, I wanted to be cremated. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's these kinds of things. And and so um, the I, I found the the right to life, right to to death and patient rights um an interesting take uh in the notes that you compiled so i don't want to step all over what you found here but because i think um i think yeah go ahead and and uh give a little give a little bit more to that yeah i think to to kind of wrap up on on richard you know richard says early on in the movie right that he is only hanging on to satisfy clarissa there's that that exchange where Mm -hmm. Clarissa is obviously taken aback, um, which to me was kind of surprising because I I can't imagine that that was the first time that he brought it up just because it seemed like so much of the movie revolved around repeated conversations, the things that he said to her um, mm-hmm. so that it was still if if this was multiple times. I mean, maybe it was the first time that he would brought it up with her, but I I, f- I still feel kind of d- I find that difficult to believe. Um, but she it's we don't talk about death. Um, we don't talk about dying. Um, Mm -mm. we don't, we, we have this image of of folks with chronic illnesses or people who are literally dying as being brave and soldiering on and being survivors. Right. And, um, when your body is wasting away and, you know, you're in pain every day, and especially if you're also isolated and you have all those other things going on, um, it's a little hard to put that brave face on, right. It's a little hard to be the, the perfect survivor um of a chronic illness and so um you know it's it's one of those moments where he's really trying to be real with her and having that conversation with her and um you know her response is you know people stay alive for each other and and says you know the doctors said that you could live like this for years and um clearly missing like what he's trying to say which yeah. is that he feels like he's done like he's ready to let go and she's not ready to let go of him um, yeah. And so at that point, I think that that's that's a good time. Well, I think way, way, way before this point, we should be having conversations about what those points are. But I think yeah. that's definitely like if not then, then now having that conversation about when you're ready to go. Um, and I think that that's an interesting contrast to Virginia and Laura, who both ended up providing. They said some version of the statement like either I stay here and die, like staying here 
in this environment for me is death or I leave and I live and I'm choosing life. Right. Um, and they were both younger and healthier, um, than, than Richard was, but I, I found it interesting that they both kind of have that, um, that same expression and, and that the monologue from Virginia at the train station, you know, I, I have it written down, but I, I am not going to read it out, but it, it's, it's my, one of my favorite parts in the movie because she, I mean, Nicole Kidman just delivers it beautifully. I went for a walk. A walk. Is that all? Just a walk. Virginia, we must go home now. Nellie's cooking dinner. She's already had a very difficult day. It's just our obligation to eat Nellie's dinner. There is no such obligation. No such obligation exists. Virginia, you have an obligation to your own sanity. I've endured this custody. I've endured this imprisonment. Oh, Virginia. I am attended by doctors everywhere. I am attended by doctors who inform me of my own interests. They know your interests. They do not. I do not speak for my interests. Virginia, I I can see that it must be hard for a a woman of your... Of what? uh, Of my what? Exactly. Your talents to see that she may not be the best judge of her own condition. Who then is a better judge? You have a history! You have a history of confinement. We brought you to Richmond because you have a history of fits, moods, blackouts, hearing voices. We brought you here to save you from the irrevocable damage you intended upon yourself. You've tried to kill yourself twice. I live daily with that threat. I set up the press. We set up the printing press, not just for itself, not just purely for itself, but so that you might have a a ready source of absorption and of remedy. Like needlework. It was done for you! It was done for your betterment. It was done out of love. If I didn't know you better, I'd call this ingratitude. I am ungrateful. You call me ungrateful. My life has been stolen from me. I'm living in a town I have no wish to live in. I'm living no wish to live. How did this happen? It is time for us to move back to London. This is not you speaking, Virginia. This is an aspect of your it illness. Is me. It's it not is, you. It is my voice. It's not your it's voice. Mine and mine it's mine alone. It's the voice it, that it, you hear. It is not. It is mine. I'm dying in this town. If you were thinking clearly, Virginia, you'd recall it was London that brought you low. If I were thinking clearly. If I were thinking clearly. If I were thinking clearly, Leonard, I would tell you that I wrestle alone in the dark, in the deep dark, and that only I can know, only I can understand my own condition. You live with the threat, you tell me. You live with the threat of my extinction. Leonard, I live with it too. This is my right is the right of every human being. I choose not the suffocating anesthetic of the suburbs, but the violent jolt of the capital. That is my choice. The meanest patient is even the very lowest is allowed some say in the matter of her own prescription. Thereby she defines her humanity. between Richmond and death. 
I choose death. Very well, London then. We go back to London. Um, and I just feel like that's such a powerful moment of, of just pushing back against the institutions that are telling her how she should be feeling, right? Her husband, who at times is telling her how she should be feeling. There's mm -hmm. a moment where she takes a walk in the morning and he says something like, well, if I could take a walk mid-morning, I'd be a happy man, right? And, and so she's got all these people telling her how she should be. Um, and who she should be. And she, this is her pushing back and saying, my right to life and liberty, right, is is being trampled on and I, yeah. I won't allow it to happen. Um, and Laura is not so passionate about it as, as, as Virginia is, but she still shares a story of, you know, feeling trapped as a mother feeling trapped in this in this marriage with the i mean john c Riley plays dan wonderful he seems like a wonderful guy but she's not into him um <laughs> and and um you know after she shares that kiss with kitty and and has that breakdown and you know kind of realizes that you know everything feels really wrong you know she says it was death i chose life and she you know she left her kids it was hard to do she moved to canada and became a librarian if i remember correctly yep um, and it seems like she's she's okay with that decision. She doesn't expect anybody to forgive her, but she had to make that decision for herself. And so, in those two cases, I would call those you know almost right to life or, or patient life, you know, types of examples. Yeah, I I one hundred percent agree. Um, and I felt like her uh, Laura mon Laura's monologue in the end, um. Not as not as powerful as as um, Nicole Kidman delivering Virginia Woolf's, but um, uh, decently uh, elucidating mm -hmm. uh, is in that in in that uh, monologue. She says that uh, she did it because she had to, and um, that she didn't want she didn't want people to think after her think think about her anymore because um i don't think her self-esteem was uh at an all-time high so she just sort of wanted to live a uh life of quiet resolution um and i think i don't know if it was the child actor or not but i, I was sort of thrown with this uh it, it was kind of hard to tell what that child actor was thinking when they kept zooming in on him lifeless face but ed harris on the other hand um feels w what was viscerally great disdain for his mother and i think she it reiterated that um at clarissa's house at the end mm -hmm. um he had her die in his book yeah oh okay there you go yeah he had her kill herself in in uh in his book and she said, I understand why he did that. It's not what happened, but I understand why he did that. Ah, OK. I missed that bit. OK, that uh, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So Ed Harris's Richard or Richie has this um, has this great disdain for her. But the, the little boy, Richie, when she's just a, a new mother, um, it's kind of hard to tell. And I I wish they had gotten a better, better little boy actor for that because I think it would have been interesting to know what he was thinking, what he was supposed to be thinking in those moments where they just had zoomed in on his face. Cause I think that would have been much more powerful to know mm -hmm. whether or not he adored her or thought she was a dummy because some of his dialogue sort of seems to represent that she was a big old failure um especially the cake baking don't remember or remember you got uh, don't forget to um mm -hmm. grease the pan and all that stuff and then of course that's reiterated later by kitty so mm -hmm. so i don't know how you know obviously he's banging on the window for her because he doesn't want her to go do something but it's kind of hard to tell what he i wish i wish so much for for <laughs> more from that little kid 
um, to tell me a little bit more about his relationship with her. I can tell you that Julianne Moore was acting the hell out of those scenes because she had very little to go on. I think, yeah, I, I got the impression he was, I, I do agree that they probably could have used or tra- like did more like work with him or whatever on, on the acting part. I don't know. It's probably really hard to work with kids, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I got the sense that he was conflicted because I got the sense that, I mean, Laura was conflicted with yeah. him, right? I, you could tell she loved him, but also like she kind of didn't want him around. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that my impression of watching the movie was that he picked up on that. And so a lot of his response to that is also a little bit off. So like he's attached to her, he's following her around, he's asking her what she's going to be doing today and like all that stuff. Right. But then there's also that moment where after the kiss happens with Kitty and she's obviously she's really mad and he's just staring at her and she's like, what do you want or whatever? And then he just yeah. like runs away. Like you get the hint that maybe she's not always super kind to him, like not necessarily abusive, but like. Yeah, like it's probably a lot of really conflicting. And I think he can kind of tell that something is off. Like there's that moment in the car where he's just like looking at her and she's like, what's wrong? And then I think I can't remember exactly what he says, but I think he might have just said, I love you or something. And she was just kind of like taken aback. Right. So I think I I got the impression that he he knows something is wrong, but he's like, what, four or something? I don't know. Yeah, ages very well. But like. He's very young. I don't think he really has the words to be like, "Mom has depression." <laughs> yeah, that's true. I will. I will give the. I will give that age group that leeway. <laughs> the child actor, however, I will not give that leeway. Okay, so as I promised um, the listeners, let's talk about your expertise a little bit um, with respect to the movie. But before you jump into the um, community psych aspects of the movie, um, please do uh, tell us, because like I said, this would be edifying for me. What is community psychology and and what do community psychologists do? Yeah, Um, so community psychology is a a subfield of psychology. It actually, it's probably easiest to explain what community psychology is by talking just very briefly about how it started. Um, okay. So in the, it's been about 50 years ago, I can't do times. Is it 60s or 70s, 70s at this point? Yeah. Um, I think it was late 60s, 68 seems to be, right? Um, the, um, some psycho- clinical psychologists got together and they said, there are some issues. <laughs> we can. <laughs> Understatement of the, of the millennia. <laughs> there are some issues here, right? Yeah. Even if, um, we, even if every single person who started, you know, a PhD program, graduated with a PhD and spent all of their time doing clinical work, we still would never have enough to serve everybody mm-hmm. that needs help. But also we can recognize that who tends to be able to afford therapy, who tends to be able to get therapy, right? People who can afford to take off of work, people who have money, um, especially because, you know, mental health care system in the U.S. doesn't always cover, um, you know, it's not always covered by insurance. Sure. So you have all these other issues. Plus, there's like stigma within certain cultures around different uh, disorders and stuff like that. Um, and then also, like, why as clinicians are we getting involved, like, after all of these symptoms show up and it's bad enough that they feel like they need to come talk to somebody about it? Why aren't we out there preventing issues before they happen? Sure. So there were, so there were all these issues that were happening. Like, one, we're never going to have enough capacity to do individual therapy with every single person who needs it. Two, there's not even equal access to that. So good luck getting to one, right? And then three, we're we're intervening at like the worst possible point, um, which is where it's already negatively affecting people's lives. Yeah. So community psychologists don't, uh, well, I guess in number four, we focus so much in clinical psychology. I, I don't think this is you know, as true today, but in clinical psychology, we focus so much on the individual. Like if a kid's not doing well in school, what is wrong with that kid? Sure. Right? Do they have ADHD? Do they have depression? Do they have something else? ODD, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Like we find out what is wrong with the kid instead of perhaps looking at what is wrong with that kid's environment. Mm -hmm. Um, What are the things that are not going well? Is there violence in the community or at home? Like, are they, is the school system underfunded? Like, you know, what are all the things that are going on? Is there a mismatch between um, the environment that the kid needs and, you know, um, and where the kid is. Um, and so 
community psychology says we're not going to just look at the individual, but we're also going to look at all the different things around them. It could be immediate things, family, schools, churches, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Or it could be broader. It could be policies. It could be, um, you know, culture, media, stuff like that. And how do these things interact with one another? So it's not even just about one of those things, but how do these things all interact with one another, right? Because policy changes can be affected by cultural changes and policy changes can also affect what resources go into what communities and that can affect outcomes for kids, even beyond like what what is going on with the kid themselves. Um, And so um, there's also a really big push in community psychology for prevention. Sure. So how do we how do we notice when things could go wrong and how do we prevent those things from going wrong? Um, so that's community psychology in a nutshell is is we like to look at beyond just the individual. So we we share a lot in common with sociology and anthropology. Um, uh, and then, you know, um, how do we prevent things um, from from getting worse? How do we fix systems? How do we engage in uh, systems change? Sure. Um, and um, yeah, that's community psychology. Nice. Well, that was a great advertising uh, spiel. I get it's, a lot of it was really good. So, what um, what community psych stuff did you pull out of this film? Yeah, I think um, kind of a meta point um, that I would probably want to talk to students about is every single person in this movie is white. Yeah. Um, I like even looked for it this time because it's set in New York. So like surely there's an extra <laughs> who who is not white. And I don't think I I, I don't think I spotted one. So I do know it's it- probably because they actually filmed on a back lot, made yeah. it look like New York and <laughs> yeah. uh, did not get New Yorkers. Yeah. they Or just, you know, anybody. I don't know. But it it's it's, you know, so one of the things that I would probably want to chat with folks about is. Um, you know, given what we know about the the history in this country, but also potentially if people have um, experiences with other countries, um, how might this story have looked differently? Um, you know, in, in cultures where maybe mental health is more stigmatized or less stigmatized, um, when we have other things too, like these women were also, you know, they were all women of means. Um, yeah. Right. They all had either jobs or they had partners that had jobs. Um you know, Clarissa's apartment is pretty nice and you can contrast that with Richard's apartment. It's not very nice. Right. Um, you know, Virginia had servants um, and, you know, Laura had a nice uh, middle class. Um, you know, that GI Bill is probably helping out with uh, with some stuff. So, right. you know, you've got, you know, you've got women who also have money to at least be financially stable or, um, you know, um, Virginia's got doctors that she goes to. Right. So. Um, yeah, doctors, you, plural. Doctors, right? They come in and examine her and, and all of this stuff. And so, you know, taking those issues together, like what, you know, how does that affect the outcomes um, for these women? And also, in, in some sense, how are these not still not protective? Um, because they do all still suffer from depression. Um, they do still all have, have these issues with communication with their partners and isolation, right? And in some cases... Um, you know, perhaps money makes it worse in, in, in Virginia's case where like they could afford to bring a printing press out to Richmond yeah. and set up shop and, you know, he's doing the real work from home stuff before before that was a thing. You don't, <laughs> That's very true. Right. You his, don't have his, that. It, his employees come out to Richmond. <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll We'll make a book out in Richmond. That's fine. Why not? You know, and so, (laughs) you know, in some cases that makes it worse because maybe maybe if they had a little bit less money, they wouldn't have been able to afford. uh, And they would have stayed in London, which was what Virginia wanted all along, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And and I I will bring up the the quick point about um, her suicide. Uh, It happens in Sussex. So Mm -hmm. at some other point, they leave London again. Mm hmm. Yeah. So she moved around a lot, I think, um, in real life. and so, yeah, you know, so money, money obviously plays a huge role in this. Um, and I think also cultural factors play a huge role in this. Um, and even though, right, even though the 2000s is considered to be more progressive and, you know, you've got people living for your lives and, you know, Richard's getting um, awards for his poetry and stuff, um, mm-hmm. which he attributes to, to having AIDS. Um, and um, oh, yeah, the uh, pity award. Yeah, he yeah. thinks it's a pity award. Um, and um, 
you know, but he still can't he clearly, you know, in part, you know, he's chronically ill, but also like his his place is kind of a mess. It's kind of run down. It's isolated. There's if you notice when Clarissa is coming in and out, there's like trash in the hallways mm -hmm. uh, kind of piled up. And so um, because, I mean, that mon that uh, that medication is, is incredibly expensive. Yeah, um, and it, it still was. Today. Yeah, and it yeah. is still it is still today. It's it's much cheaper, and there are better alternatives twenty years later. But right, it's still bad, and it was bad. Um, and it's surprising uh, for what they explain away for how long he's lived with um, AIDS slash HIV. Um, he's been he's been doing pretty well for himself, regardless yeah. of the situation, but. As you say, he is um, sort of on the the downward spiral to squalor, right? And so, and so, you have all these factors that I think are playing in. So you can talk about like the history, um, especially if folks are able to delve into like the history of of you know you know like you were mentioning with um, shell shock and PTSD and a mm -hmm. revolution of understanding that, right? Yeah. Um, Virginia's story takes place between two world wars, sure. right? Uh, between World War One and World War Two. Dan's take place after World War II. And this isn't really touched upon in the movie, probably because of filming and, and the just the timing of it. But like 2001 is when 9 11 happens. Um, that's not referenced like at all. Right? No. But, but the war part is just kind of constantly, um, you know, throughout all of this. And I think, I think sometimes that can kind of bookend some of our understanding of mental health because of the different um, diagnoses that kind of came out of those different world wars and stuff like that yeah that's a really good point i didn't even i didn't even realize the whole uh 9 11 um aspect to it the movie came out in 2002 which is interesting that they filmed it in 2001 which is why they set it in 2001 mm -hmm. um and they it's clear that uh they filmed it before the attack at new york because um, even though they are referencing the award in like October, there's snow on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's clear that this is not the beginning of the year of 2001, but meant to be later in 2001. And so, yeah, they didn't uh, they did not reference that because they did not know it happened yet. Yeah, and I think you know I think that there are these other community issues as well caregiving you know a lot of folks don't necessarily think about the the stress of caregiving it's it's really underappreciated and yeah. especially when those caregivers are themselves isolated right so um mr wolf uh, leonard um he also seems like he's pretty isolated the only other person he really talks to in the film i think well other than he's the servants in his one employee <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. And and then Virginia, I don't even think he says anything to Nellie, uh, uh, Virginia's sister, when she visits with the kids. Like, we don't yeah, even I see don't, him during that part. Yeah, right? I don't I don't recall him saying anything um, so to the children. He's, he's also isolated and he has the additional stress of of um, of caretaking. And, and yeah. he does have the language for this and he can express it to Virginia when she runs off. It doesn't sound like they talk about it a lot, but. Um, he is able to actually talk about it. But then if we contrast that with like Clarissa taking care of Richard, she she doesn't really have the language for it. She struggles to tell Lewis and, and her daughter, also Julia, um, what's going on in the deepest part of her struggles while she's in that kind of um, mental breakdown. And she doesn't ever resolve that breakdown, right? She just kind of tucks it away. Um, and I think that that, you know, that can happen a lot. And so, you know, it's not just about the network that these individuals have, but the people that care about them, who else do they also have to lean on so that they can be at their best um, as they're providing care? And, you know, do they have institutions that they can, you know, receive support from? Um, I'm actually remembering as I'm saying that um, I have a friend um, who lives in France, um, a couple of friends actually that live in France. And, <laughs> Um, uh, unfortunately, Guy uh, has passed away, but um, mm. he had Marfan syndrome, um, which is uh, a genetic disorder, I guess. Um, and it's it's very rare. Um, mm. and um, he they I remember them telling us I we I done like a fundraiser or something and raised some money um for the foundation and um she mentioned like oh this uh, um Helen his his wife um had mentioned oh. 
we actually get some materials for them sometimes. It's a U.S. foundation, but we get some materials for them sometimes that we can share with doctors um, because doctors don't know what this is, right? And so they use that educational materials too. And so thinking about like, especially if you have like a rare chronic illness, it can be very difficult to get doctors to understand what's going on, to get community members to understand what's going on, even sometimes to get family members to understand what's going on. Right. And so when you've got something like bipolar, which I would still argue is not very well understood today. 100 percent agree. You know, um, it, it, who is he going to talk to? Right. Um, and how is he going to get the support that he needs? Um, and so I think I think about the caregiving aspect you know, a lot yeah. uh, when I watch this film. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. My mom um, was an isolated caregiver. As, as soon as you started describing it, I'm like, oh boy, for, um, so she was uh, uh, the caregiver for my grandmother for many years. Um, and she's up in Wisconsin. Most of my aunts and uncles are, Elsewhere in the the country, most of them are in California still, and you know it's a it's a long trek to go mm -hmm. from California to Wisconsin regularly, and uh, you know she, so she didn't have a lot of help, and I will go out on a limb for her. I don't know if she listens to the show, but I will go out on a limb for her and be like, yeah, she was an isolated caregiver, and um, we we felt very bad for her. Um, dealing with my grandmother, an amazing woman, my grandmother. But she was very, she was a very difficult woman too. The best damn lady ever, but very, very difficult and stubborn. So you can imagine how, how tough that would have been isolated like that. So yeah, it's a really good point about the three caregivers and the, the aspects of their illnesses that um, are hard to have conversations with with other people so uh leonard wolf could didn't have anybody to talk to really um dan probably had no idea what kinds of things um that laura was going through mm -hmm. um and may at the time have attributed like many men uh, in the you know 40s 50s 60s etc et uh, may have just attributed that to pregnancy mm -hmm. weirdness, right? Like, I don't know how the pregnant woman do. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and just like maybe diluted himself in some way, like, uh, it, and it sort of diluted in, 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 or mentioned in a diluted kind of sense when um, Ray, Kitty's, or Dan's friend who is is Kitty's, Husband says, oh, she's just going to the hospital for routine stuff, even though it's actually literally probably something like uh, ovarian cysts or endometriosis or something like that. Right. Yeah, or even even potentially like ovarian cancer. Right. It's like yeah, it's or, literally yeah, a too. growth in her uterus. Sure. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not routine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And so so we we have that um aspect of the 1950s playing there. And then um with um Clarissa and uh taking care of a for all for what appears to be all intents and purposes our last which is our last topic of of the episode which is um the sexuality and, and LGBT community aspects of the film that are represented by the characters um, is ostensibly um, a gay man and probably from what is uh, assumed uh, in the film, at least from my take, um, is that he got HIV through uh, being, a mem uh, being a member of the gay community and how it was transmitted there. Um, in the 1980s, 90s. And we don't know, like I said, how long he's had it for, but it has advanced to a stage where he's got sores on his skin. They do make an effort to show that and that he's you know, done with living, as he's, he says. And then Clarissa seems to be part of that community as well because she has a she's had a 10 year relationship with a woman named Sally. And so she's a, um, either a lesbian or, or bisexual, as you had um, mentioned, Crystal. Um, and so. She still, as you said, refers to Sally as a friend 
as opposed to her partner. And so this is 2001. And you said about the, you know, the whole 2000s, you know, turn of millennium being uh, all super progressive and everything like that. But it was still very uh, difficult to find community in that world and especially um for clarissa talking to other people about a gay man with aids so you have these three character three caretakers who are um their own victim of time period and circumstance in addition to the three uh women who are or actually i should say three characters because we have to flip um, Richard and Clarissa as far as who's who in the dyad. Um, but then you have the two women, Virginia Woolf and, and uh, Laura, and then Richard in this case for the modern uh, dyad. You have them um, being victims of their own um, I- their own issues, whether they be mental health issues or or physical health issues. Um, and the, the, the caretakers, I I think that's, uh, an amazing point. And I'm so, so happy that I got to noodle on that while you were talking. Yeah, I think, um, I think that these are interesting tensions that, you know, they, they're going through some similar issues, um, within their relationships, um, throughout uh, these time periods, you know, Vir- Virginia Woolf, you know, we did mention briefly that that kiss with her sister. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard to tell. I, to me, I've never read that as like a, a passionate kiss in terms of like incest, sexual passion. Yeah. Yeah. And like not incest. incestual. Yeah. It seems more like I need to feel something. Um, yeah. Is kind of the, the gist that I get with it. But, you know, there is still that interaction between women. The The real Virginia Woolf, as I understand it, did have some romantic letters that she exchanged, I think, with like a nurse or something that she'd had at one point. Oh. Um, hmm. So, you know, there is kind of that that kind of background there. Um, but certainly it would have been stigmatized um, during that during that time period. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, we've got Laura, who is kind of a she's kind of trapped both in, you know, her gender roles also trap her in terms of. Sure sexuality as well um there's this kind of awkward conversation between laura and kitty um before their kiss where laura just kind of seems a little bit out of it but she says you know they came home from the war you know they they deserved it didn't they and then kitty says what did they deserve and then laura says i don't know us i guess all of this and she kind of motions to the house um so it almost feels like she's minimizing her own agency in her marriage. Yeah. You know, indirectly, she's it almost sounds like I was given away to this man who came home from war, who had apparently been thinking about me while he was at the war. And I decided, why not? Right. It just kind of yeah. seems like this is the thing that you need to do. Right. Um, and she's she's expected to have to be this perfect mother and to be able to bake cakes and to take care of her kid and to love taking care of her kids and to want to write. Um, Kitty, I hate it when she says it. Like I cringe every time when she says, "I don't think you can really be a woman until you've had a child or something like that." Or yeah, she mother. does mention that. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Uh, it just <laughs> it just makes me feel so gross every time she says it. But it is, I mean, it is a common a common feeling. And so, and then you you have this subversion of that, right? When Laura is trying to um, calm Kitty down, who's really upset because she's worried about this upcoming. Um, surgery and how there's going to be this guy that she's never met rooting around in there and like what does he care about her well-being right yeah and then they kiss and they share this moment and it almost seems like it's it's it feels like it's a mutual attraction it's a mutual Mm -hmm. enjoyment of that kiss but then you know as soon as that happens like that spell is kind of broken and and kitty gets up and she just immediately pretends like i've wiped it from my memory you know Mm -hmm. um she's Men and blacked herself um, with the little, the little pen, and and you know Laura tries to address it. Like, can we talk about what just happened? You know, and she's like, "What?" You know, and just just kind of leaves, and that leaves you know Laura to be really upset and confused. And I mean, I would be confused if I made an advance on somebody and then they immediately pretended it didn't happen. That would be really upsetting, right? Um, and um, I, I was just. 
I, it, it's almost as if it was the unstated rule uh, at the time, the unwritten rule, like, oh, we did the thing and I experienced like it, the Katy Perry song. And then, well, uh, it's apparently Las Vegas and what stays, what happens here stays here. I'm sorry. What were you talking about? We had a great conversation, but <laughs> I, for the life of me, can't remember it. Right. And so it's just really, you know, it's that kind of awkward moment. And I can't ever tell what's going on in in Laura's mind at that point. Because it's probably a lot. Um, both like, am I going to get, is she going to tell anybody? Am mm-hmm. I going to get in trouble for this? Because also it's an extramarital kiss, you know? Um, sure. You know, did, is she ever going to talk to me again? Because if, if Kitty's her only friend, then now she's going to be even more isolated if that friendship is ruined, right? So it's like a lot going on there. And then maybe also just some surprise that she did that, right? Because she almost seems surprised that that happened. Um, I think so- possibly also the uh, the impetus for her um, resolve to create a plan to execute her suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though she changes her mind before she starts taking any pills... Um, I think it's still the impetus for what she decides later. You yeah. know, it, it's interesting as a viewer to watch that time jump. Obviously, we we see her again after this moment. We see her again as an older woman where, you know, 50 uh, years have passed. And but we we see it like, you know, it's been five minutes or whatever. And then we see this. Expl- then we we hear this explanation of why she left, but we don't actually see her agony over the course of the remainder of the pregnancy because I mean you know she's probably what seemed to be um, halfway along maybe I don't know we'll just say that um, and uh, the she doesn't say how uh, how soon after her daughter's. Um, born that she that she leaves but the agony still in uh, over that as well as probably other incidences before she decides to um leave for canada um for her for her next life uh yeah. so i thought that was i thought that was an interesting uh, interesting take uh, as you were talking about all the things that were going through her mind right after that kiss. Yeah, and I, I also wonder, you know, one of the things that I hear about frequently in terms of suicide is often people are kind of most at peace once they have that plan um, and they know that there's, you know, there's an action that is going to, to occur. And um, sometimes I wonder if with her plan to, to leave, if there maybe was some of that same, like, now there's an end date. Right. Like, OK, let's say three months after my daughter's born, I'm out of here. Right. Mm-hmm. Then it's it seems like it's almost a little bit more doable than. Yeah, I might potentially have to spend the rest of my life as a, as a wife and then as a grandmother and then as, you know, all of these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, it's hard to tell. I mean, we're projecting yeah. I, and, and um, what's the word? Um, we're trying to extrapolate. Beyond. Yeah, we're extrapolating at this point, but it is kind of interesting to think about, like, what would that have experience been like? Because there's part of it is the agony of like, I'm still going through with this birth that I'm not really interested in and mm-hmm. in going through. Right. right. And I'm I'm still married to a guy who seems nice, but I'm just not really not that into him. And mm-hmm. I've still got this kid and maybe Kitty never talked to her again. Maybe Kitty pretended it never happened. Who knows, right? I mean, I think I think we can pretty safely rule out that Kitty came back and said, "I love you. Let's run off together." Because we know right. that didn't happen. I was kind of but- hoping <laughs> after we saw, uh, after we saw Laura show up after the death of her uh, her son Richard, that she was going to say that she was going to say, "Oh yeah," and then Kitty came back and. I decided that's not the life that I wanted and I left my kids and because she had already said that, you know, Dan mm-hmm. had, had died of cancer and uh, the sister had died young, et cetera. It's like, I was just, I was really hoping for that. But in retrospect, it seems like that that was never going to happen because that was, um, like I said, the impetus for a life-changing moment 
And I don't know if, as you said before, Kitty and Laura ever shared commonalities. Yeah. And I, I think about sometimes like, you know, did she seem, Laura seems resolute with, you know, she seems okay at peace with the decisions that she made. She understands that that makes her a monster in a lot of people's eyes, but like, she seems like she has made peace with that. But Mm -hmm. I still wonder if, what did she do in Canada? Did she, did she date women? Did she, it doesn't, she probably wouldn't have dated men, right? It just did not seem like she was interested in Dan, maybe not even interested in men at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe she stayed by herself. Maybe she was asexual and, you know, that was just a testing water. You know, we, we don't, we don't know much about Laura, but I think sometimes about that, like, even though obviously she's a fictional character, <laughs> um, you know, what kind of life does did she lead in the last 50 years as, as a librarian? Was she happy to, to be introverted and be with herself or, um, you know, did she did she have romance or any of those um, experiences? Yeah. Hard to was, know. You know, did she just love, you know, the books? Dibuhia, you know, yeah. she was just a fan of those books. And I want to thank Dr. Crystal Stelton Pohl for joining me to discuss the hours. Before we say goodbye, Crystal, is there anything that you would like to plug? Where can others find out more about your work and what you do? Sure, yeah. So if you're interested in my work, I suppose you can go to my website, which is CNS, almost like Central Nervous System, uh young.com um that's not intentional those are my initials um where you you can find my work there uh, you can also follow me on twitter at crystal ns young um i'd also like to let folks who are interested in psychology know about the psychological science accelerator which is a global network of psychology labs that are working together to do some really cool team science stuff and um for those i'm sure um there are a lot of listeners who are interested in education So I'd also like to plug the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base, which is a community of volunteer advocates who are working with researchers, educators, and really anybody that's interested in open scholarship. So to share open access educational resources. Um, So anybody that's looking for great classroom material, or if you have anything that you'd like to share that you've made, um, check out the uh, OSKB. Awesome. I will link those in our show notes for this episode so thank you for shouting them out they'll definitely uh get some clicks from me thank you again crystal yeah thanks for having me this has been really fun i i I, i'm glad to hear that and that's gonna do it for this episode until the next episode thanks for listening 